second presentation, uh, we've seen Kleben show kind of, kind of the underbelly of Web Model Federation. Uh, I don't know that much about it as he does, but uh, I do have experience with it on a project. Um, so I will kind of be showing it from that perspective and I'm just kind of using some things, uh, which are maybe some, a, a couple of levels above, which are abstracted around Webpack. So yeah, I'm here at Infinium for five or so years. I'm a, a JavaScript team lead and uh, I've been working with Tangler most, most of that time and recently with uh, Module Federation. So let's first take a look at the journey of, of the buzzword. Uh, so Google had some kind of change in how they measure things. So this is more or less kind of continuing the trend. Uh, so it's not like it didn't have any like huge spikes, but it's slowly increasing in kind of uh, popularity, uh, at least when it comes to Google searches. Uh, it kind of started in 2016 or so, but uh, I would say that the tooling didn't really become good, useful for something that you would do on a day-to-day -day basis until I would say quite recently. Um, but yeah, uh, what, was, what, what were we trying to solve? So we started out, out with maybe kind of monoliths, like this, this would be your PHP application that, that, that does everything in one application. It maybe has some JavaScript, but that's kind of not the focus. Then we split up between front-end and back-end because we wanted like more interaction on the front-end and to have a separate team, etc. Uh, and then the back-end guys came in and said, okay, we will split up into microservices. And the V on the front-end were kind of jealous we had nothing like that. Uh, we were just being some APIs, but we were like one huge application that was working with many smaller services. So yeah, so we tried to kind of uh, do the same thing on the front end. Uh, and we ended up with kind of end-to-end -end teams with micro front ends. This is something that you could do. You don't need to have full stack developers. So if someone is doing like the checkout feature, it doesn't have to be like team of full stack developers who do everything in that stack, but you can have like a team of backend developers who do, who do that thing about checkout and you can have frontend developers who do the, just the checkout uh, feature of the application. So these teams can now be kind of independent. Um, so let, let's, let's take a look at like what are some of the goals of this micro frontends architecture. So, we would like to be framework agnostic. So those individual teams which we've seen, they could like each be doing their own thing, what they know, it might be review, uh, react, angular, whatever. Um, that is maybe not the largest benefit because uh, I think you, like, you would still like everyone to know uh, the technology of other teams. So maybe that's not that much of a value, but it is uh, valuable that the teams become independent. You can share code between applications and also runtime uh, and also state at runtime uh, and uh, since everything is kind of part of the same co cohesive thing you can share coding standards as well uh, those individual applications will be deployed independently so if one of them is down or if the build fails it will not block all the other teams because the build is failing on develop branch because the build will be failing only for that one application. The other ap applications can continue working on their, on their things. Um, since you have those like uh, vertical stacks, you, you kind of want to follow domain driven design. That's maybe most useful if you're doing full stacks. So then one person really like knows the full domain of that feature uh, and designs things in that way with, with all the entities that come with that, etc. cetera. Um, now, even though, yeah, so to achieve that those teams are independent, you need to set some clear boundaries, okay? So we will have some shareable things, but like I have this thing of mine and I don't want you using it, I don't want you changing it. So you still want to set something like that and it's doable. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the two main benefits I would say in the end are that you can have faster build times and independent deployments. So if you have a, a monolith application that has like even if it has lazy loading, you're still building one application and it can take a lot of time. If you're building each individual application, it will be much faster to deploy a bug fix for just one application that has a bug. Um, yeah, and that is possible because you can deploy independently. 
just to briefly go how we serve applications. Uh, so a classic single page app, um, like you request a home page, server will re return you basically an empty HTML file with some scripts, but it won't render the content. Then you will fetch some application JavaScript code and you will render something on the front end on the browser to, to get something, uh, to, to show something to the user. Um, with the monolith, you might have, let's say, lazy loading. So you still go through the initial part where you render some like headers, etc. But now you navigate to say, let's say, movies route. Uh, I'm building a, a Plex clone here. Um, so you like navigate to movies and you have a lazy loaded chunk that you, that you load and you render that page. You go to the other page, which is about TV shows. You load that chunk and you render it. But the, everything is part of one build and everything is served from, let's say, some S3 bucket. Um, now with, with uh, micro frontends, we have the same kind of things being requested. So we go through the main part of the application, but when we want to fetch the movies module, which is, let's say, an application on its own, uh, we fetch it from a different place and that's part of a different build and a different release. Um, and the same for shows, it's a, it's a third location for the shows. Uh, and here, obviously, you can deploy something here and you will get the update on the main app. Uh, pizzas are here, someone needs to help him. Uh, yeah, so compared to this, we're getting same things but from different places. Uh, now, uh, you've seen Clement set up module federation. Uh, I would say it's cool to know that, but you won't be, you don't want to do that in day-to-day -day life. I mean, con congrats to Clement for knowing it and for showing it to us, but uh, as soon as you have to write underscore underscore webpack, like, that will break. Um, so NX is a relatively new tooling last couple of years uh, where they, their starting focus was to let, help you build monorepos um, but over the time they added like more and more features and they also recently added some good tooling around the uh, module federation which abstracts a lot of that configuration that uh, Clement showed. So there's a couple of different types of monorepo that you can create um, and we will be, I will be showing you something that's called an integrated monorepo uh, but there are some other types as well. Um, and it froze. Okay. Um, so it works with many different frameworks. Uh, I'll be showing you an example on, on, on Angular. And uh, once it's, it will set up a bunch of files and the whole structure, uh, but then you can start using what are called generators for creating libraries, for creating applications, uh, and, and some other things. Generators can also like uh, generate individual components for whichever framework you want, or they can generate end-to-end -end tests, they can generate a lot, lots of different things. Uh, so here you can see like an example of a, a command which would generate a new remote application. So you've seen I had like movies, shows applications, now I would also like, like music application, and the host application will be Flex or Plex, something like that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and show you this fake application. Um, and not Slack. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so this is my application running. Um, just to quickly show you how it was served. Uh, so it was served using this command. So we served the Plex application which is our root application, our host application, but then we also serve movies and shows applications as dev remotes. So they will be like also both our host application and our, let's call them child applications, they will all get rebuilt as your editing files. Um, if you didn't have this part, they would just be uh, the movies and shows applications would still get built, but only initially. Um, they would not be like hot reloaded. Um, okay, so that's how I'm running the application. Uh, and it's here, what it does, like I have some uh, home page, I have the movie app, 
I have the Shows app. It's ugly. I mean, I'm not a designer, uh, but it is my. Sh <laughs> but this is my favorite show, uh, and this is like just you refresh every time you get a different show. But I only have three shows, so it's quite low probability of getting a different one when I refresh. Um, yeah, and here I, I think I have also like a details page, um, and I have a login here, so I can log out. You can see here that on. Home. This is like my root application. It just has some kind of welcome message. I can log in here, whatever, and you can see here it, it shows me a message that I'm logged in. It gives me my name, and that's in the host application. When I go to the movies application, that application also knows about my uh, username that I'm logged in. And this is like the main reason why we decided to take this approach with micro frontends on our project that we were working on, because we had many different teams working on different applications, but they all use kind of the same UI library, the same design system, they all use the same uh, authentication and permission management things, and like all of them were re-implementing login screen on their, in their application, and it looked slightly different <laughs> in, it, in each of them, like the, uh, it wasn't pixel perfect between them. Um, so this uh, allows you to share some state between all of the applications. Um, when we are talking about Angular, um, we are talking about services. So service is like, uh, you can use it for state management. Uh, and that's how I have like some kind of authentication service here, which is then shared between all the all the applications, which is uh, what Clement showed like singleton it would be and shared between all of them. Uh, and then all of them get the same instance and they can check is the user logged in. Um, so just a bit about the structure of the repository. You kind of have a split between applications and, uh, okay, I'll delete this. This is some, something from the testing out that they did. Uh, you have some applications, which is my root application, movies application, and the shows application. And I have a couple of libraries. I have my authentication service that uh, I demoed. Um, it's an Angular service that has uh, an observable of the user. So it can either be like uh, user or null. So the applications, know, applications can know if the user is logged in. Um, I have some more libraries. I have uh, my TVDB service, which fetches data from TVDB. So not every application has to implement some commonly used service for fetching data, for example. I have some utilities and I have some UI library, which just has a card component. Uh, nothing too fancy. Now, uh, let's take a look at how, how we have set up the connection between all of these things. I will first show you this visually by running. So as I said, the tooling has just kind of be became good. So NX has this uh, graph uh, functionality where it shows you the dependencies between all of your projects, including applications and libraries. Um, and here my movies library is using the authentication and it's using the UI library because it shows those cards and cards are part of the UI library and it shows me is the user logged in or not? So it's using the authentication and it's using the TVDB because it's fetching some data. Um, my shows application isn't using UI library because it doesn't have card. I mean, in reality, it would probably at least use some kind of button which would be part of UI, but in, in, in my simple example, it's not using anything from UI. So it's just using TVDB and some mocks. Uh, and authentication is used in the root app, because it's the root app is handling login logout, setting the state in the authentication service. And it's also used in movies, because the movies application uh, shows me that message. Uh, the shows application doesn't show anything re related to the user, so it's not depending on the authentication. Uh, so as the project grows larger, this will help you to kind of figure out the dependencies. If you have multiple teams working on like uh, different parts of the applications, you will you will at some points have to sync between all of you, and this will be helpful. Um, okay, so this this was like the visual representation. Let's take a look at uh, let's not take a look at some some uh, console here. Um, 
Okay. I will refresh. I will refresh here. There's a bunch of stuff that gets loaded because Angular has a bunch of stuff. Um, but uh, notably, everything is from localhost 42,000. That's my root application where it's running. Uh, and some fonts, whatever, for material. Uh, I will clear it now. And I will go to the movies application. You will see here that we have fetched uh, a remote entry module, which is served from a different domain, essentially. I mean, when I'm running locally from a different port. But in production, it, this would be a completely different domain, URL, subdomain, whatever. Um, and it's, this is fetching the data for my, uh, for my child application. And if I do the same for the shows, it's another different domain. Uh, please ignore that some things like appear twice uh, because I have uh, MSW running, so it's kind of bypassing some of those uh, requests. I use the MSW just for like setting some mock data, so I'm not being the, the actual API. Um, okay, so let's take a look uh, how it how it's connected in the code. So how does my root application know where to fetch the child applications? So my uh, Plex application has these assets. And this is kind of the file which tells you, this is like the name of the federated module. If you also remember, Clement had to define a name. Uh, this is like where it will be fetched from. Uh, there are two types of module federation when you're using NX. Um, you have static module federation and dynamic module federation. The difference is that with static module federation, these values are baked into the build. So if you have to deploy to multiple environments, you would have to build for each of those environments with different values for where will the chunk be loaded from. But with dynamic module federation, this can all be done at runtime. And uh, yeah, I'll just quickly show here again. Um, so one of the first things that get loaded is this module federation JSON file. And th this is what then, during the initialization of the root application, this is what is read, so we know where to load the other modules from. And uh, you can make a single build, and then uh, some of the nice DevOps guys, when they're deploying to different environments, they would just replace values here. But it would remain the same build. And I think that's also kind of important when you build for staging, you test there, you don't want to rebuild to deploy pro to production. I mean, you never know when, like, you will get uh, a new version of some NPM package and it will break. So this is the way you ensure it's an identical build. You just change the URLs um, for production. Uh, yeah, so, so this file gets updated at, uh, at, during deployment. Uh, there is also, yeah, so, so that's, that's what the host application needs to know. Uh, the child applications kind of have to expose something on, on that domain, right? So uh, if we take a look at the module federation, this is the just one small piece of the Webpack config. So you also remember Clement had that this exposes part, um, and here he named the module somehow. Uh, what I'm exposing here for each, each of the individual applications, I'm just exposing the routes which it will be handling. Um, and uh, in in the uh, example of Angular, so here if I look at the movies are maybe a better example. So I have my remote entry and these are the routes and this is what gets exposed. So this gets bundled up with Webpack, with Federation and this is what I can load from my host application. And then uh, as, as you continue forward with navigating through the application, then you also have some lazy loading of individual components, which will also be, be served from a different chunk, but also from that other domain. Uh, yeah, so this basically gets bundled up and federated. Uh, the same is done for the shows application as well, uh, but it's, it's a bit simpler. Uh, it has just one route. Uh, okay, so let's say we want to change something, let's say in our, our UI library. Now, how do we figure out what needs deployment? 
So I'll uh, I'll I'll first uh, branch out. Okay, nice naming uh, convention that I'm following here, um, and uh, I will just do something like I will take this card title, and I will make it. Uh, I'll make it like uppercase. Okay, and I will like commit that. Oops. Changes. Okay. Uh, I like uh, two packs song changes. So uh, that's why I'm doing this. Okay, so now I have uh, now I've changed something, but like I won't go manually through all the applications to figure out which ones will be affected by this change. So there is uh, a command annex graph uh, or it's annex affected graph. Um, have I committed? Ah, okay, I think it's already run. Uh, I, I already have the graph command running. Okay, I'll restart it. Okay, so NX affected graph. Show affected projects, or actually show all projects. Um, now I can see highlighted, because I've changed the UI library, it kind of figures out which other projects or applications or libraries, whatever they are, which ones were affected by that change. And uh, like I can see it's the movies, and because movies is older from Flex application, it's also kind of affected. So now you can know, okay, we, we don't have to redeploy shows, we just have to redeploy the movies application. And uh, here we actually don't need to deploy the Plex application either, but sometimes you will have to kind of figure out this graph. It, it will sometimes show more things than you actually need to deploy, uh, but like you won't lose out on anything if you also deploy the root application that that would also be it won't break anything but it would it might be unnecessary um, yeah so so this command is really useful even if you you can give it uh, two commits between which it would compare and you could give it like commit of of some previous release to production you can give it like the latest commit and it will tell you okay these are the projects that you need deploying uh, in production uh, okay so I think this is this is a really useful tool. Um, now let's let's try uh, let's try creating a new application. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of files here, so doing everything by hand would be uh, painful. But uh, I did mention I did mention the generators, so nx generate, and I will be I will be generating a remote application. I will name it music, and I will let it know that the host application is my Plex application. Um, the reason why I have to define the host because you don't need to have this completely flat structure. So you can ha you can have a remote application, which is then also a host for some other deeper children. So you can have the whole hierarchy here. Uh, so depending on the scale of the project, you might have multiple levels of this. Um, okay, so I'll run it. I'll choose SCSS. Uh, it generates a bunch of files because, again, this is Angular. Um, it, so let's take a look at what it generated. Um, so these are the, the changes which it did. So it created the app in the music. It also created a Cypress end-to-end -end testing project, uh, which you can not generate if you don't want to, but it's kind of it's good to have an easy start with testing, so you have no excuses not to do it. Um, and it also generated a couple of things in our uh, root application. So it added a new entry to our module federation manifest, so we know that this music application will be loaded for some, from somewhere else. It added some declarations for TypeScript, which are not that important at this moment. And it also automatically added a route. So this is also kind of nice. Uh, you can maybe move it to somewhere else or rename it, but it's nice that it already did it for you. Okay, and uh, what it did for the application, I mean, it has some, it has this remote entry. Uh, it has, uh, it will be easier to see it like this. So it has this remote entry, which is basically empty. Um, some welcome placeholder component, routes, etc. So I'll just rerun my dev server because I'm not completely sure if it, if it, it will figure out the change if it adds so much files. Okay, let's try it. 
okay? Uh, I mean, I don't have it in the router, in, in the links, in the navigation, but I will just type music, okay? And this is like the placeholder thing that it generated. Uh, and it was loaded from 4203 port, right? Um, and that's like, uh, it's really powerful to have tooling like this because otherwise you could spend hours setting this up. Um, yeah, and we see this change that I did with uppercase, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, now let's, this was the demo. Uh, it looked pretty cool, if I do say so myself, but um, it's not a silver bullet and it does come with some problems of its own. Um, so when should you, uh, so first, this is a great book. It's so great book that I put it in such small fo font, um, but it's uh, from Manfred Steyr. Uh, he's one of the prominent Angular architects, something like that. And um, it's like 140 pages. I stole some images from here, but I, I gave credit, so that's fine. And um, he, he covers uh, a lot of topics here. Um, he mentions NX as well. It's a free book, you can get it online. Uh, I linked it in the resources later on. It does focus on Angular, but it covers everything conceptually as well. Um, so he has this chart for deciding if you should use uh, micro frontends or not. So if you have very little shared state between uh, applications, then like just do hyperlinks and navigate to a completely different page. Uh, if you have shared state, um, do you have some legacy applications that would be kind of hard to migrate to a monorepo or something like that? And maybe they're not even using React or not even Webpack, so you would have to completely change the build process. If it's like legacy apps, just load that legacy app in an iframe, perhaps. If it is something more modern, you already have Webpack there. Um, do you have like, uh, uh, do you need separate deployments? If you don't need separate deployments, if it's still okay for you to build everything at once and deploy everything to one server, if it's not too big of a problem for you, if it's not taking too long, if it's not an issue that individual teams cannot deploy whenever they want, but they have to all kind of sync to do it on some kind of schedule, then just like do a monolith with, uh, like do have lazy loading, but it will be a single build. Uh, with libraries, you, you can organize code in libraries and applications, but it would be a single build and you could use a monorepo for that. Or even not a monorepo, you, you can use something, uh, you can use multiple repos. But if you are lucky enough to get to this part where you do need separate deployments and maybe even a mix of technologies like React and Angular, although I wouldn't recommend it, um, you can then bootstrap server, server, several individual single page apps with module federation. Okay, um, so don't do it if you don't have to, which is a bit maybe unfair uh, because it is a cool technology, but I would say don't do it if you can't reap the benefits. So the benefits were what, what listed under goals, you can share state, you can have independent deployments of, of multiple teams. Um, now, now that we've been doing it on the project for some time, some of these are like Angular specific, but uh, in Angular, there is a thing like called app initializer, which is a piece of code which runs uh, before the, app, the, the root component is bootstrapped. And it allows you to kind of do some in initialization logic, uh, like maybe you could check if the user is logged in, things like that. Um, and you can't do that with micro frontends because only one application gets initialized and that's the root application. All the other ones are basically lazy loaded. Um, and uh, here you have to figure something out. There's nothing out of the box. We created something that we called module initializer, which is kind of uh, the same API, but it's not on the application level, but on the module level. Um, and now I remember that I actually forgot to show you uh, how does the, like what's the, how does the, how does the host application define routes? So just quickly to go through that. Um, so this is like a regu regular lazy loading of welcome components that, that's part of the host application. And this 
is lazy loading of a micro front end. Uh, really, the only difference is that you are using this helper method from uh, uh, NXS package for uh, micro front ends with Angular. Um, so you kind of it's very similar it's a definition of route, just using this helper. Okay. Um, so next thing, uh, th there was a mention of loading of assets. So when you build an Angular application, each application as part of the build can load its own assets like fonts and it will be served on like localhost slash assets slash name of the file. Um, but if you try doing that from a micro front end application, if you, it gets loaded from the root domain, you try fetching slash assets slash some image but it will try fetching from the local post 4200, not from 4201. So it doesn't exist. So you, you either like have to make all the assets available in some centralized place, or you can bundle them, inline them, uh, using Webpack or just like inline SVGs. Um, or what we've did, we've let each micro frontend application know okay, this is your application URL. So then when it's fetching assets, it kind of knows what its URL will be, which will be localhost 4201. 40, and then it would, it would prepend that to fetching any assets. So it would fetch from the assets build of the micro frontend. Um, if you need environment specific, let's say, uh, just like we haven't baked into the build the URL from which micro frontends are served. We also don't want to bake into the build things like API URL because there was also change from environment to environment. And uh, it's, it's kind of similar thing as we've seen with the um, module federation manifest JSON. We just add some environment JSON file which will hold the URLs to the API. And then that will also be, then the values will get replaced when you go to deployment. Um, global styles and providers kind of similar to assets. You, global styles, you will have to do them all in the root uh, micro front end application. So if you have some uh, global fonts, global heading styles, you have to do it in the root application. Um, deployment synchronization, um, I've showed that off, like NX affected, you can use NX affected to figure out when to deploy, which applications require deployment at which point. Mm. <coughs> It sounds like a great, next point is that it sounds like a great idea to pick and mix different frameworks, but I, I wouldn't do it in this kind of setup uh, because you, you would lose some benefits. Like if, you, if, if we added that uh, music, music uh, application as a React application, like that React application can't use service that is from Angular, like the authentication service. So you would need to define some kind of mechanism on your own, which would be for sharing state between applications. And then you would end up attaching something to window or local storage and uh, I don't like it. Um, dependency updates. Um, there is a possibility to have a mix of versions of some, let's say, third party dependencies. But uh, I Again, not something that would be re recommended. It's best to stick with using the same versions of all the libraries for all, all the micro frontends. So that means if you update libraries, you have to deploy all the applications uh, and just stick to those exact versions. Don't do multiple versions. And to make that easy, you should update regularly or else it will be a really uh, painful thing to do. Um, you, even though those teams are independent, you will end up with situation where, situations where you, when some of them depend on each other in some way. So here, yeah, you just have to plan, communicate on your refinements and things like that. Uh, next topic, we are in a monorepo, so there will be a lot of branches potentially. Um, what I would say here is try to have as little branches as possible. Don't like like you can't create a release branch because that release branch will be only for one project. So you would have to create release hyphen application name and then the version. And you would have a bunch of release branches. So I would say, and I think this will make Clement happy, like don't do many branching, 
just commit to develop or main branch, deploy from there. If you've broken it, fix it. It's not easy to do that, uh, but uh, it will make managing of those branches much easier if you don't have them. Um, when it comes to coding standards, you will have like many teams of many people working in the same monorepo. You might get a mix of styles of how people code or some even some different standards. So here, use tooling as much as possible. You can have a shared ESLint config between all of the projects. So that will kind of enforce as much as you can with that. Prettier should be used in the whole monorepo, so it all kind of looks similar, at least from formatting perspective. Um, inevitably, some applications might stop being maintained. So let's say you have to update Angular from 14 to 15. There are some breaking changes, and it has to be handled in applications. Um, and like the team who is working on some, let's say, deprecated application just doesn't have the budget or time to do it. Uh, at that point, I would say, like, remove that project from the monorepo, uh, give it its own fork of the monorepo, and they can, like, stick on their own version and remove them from the module federation story. Then you would just, like, hyperlink to their application. And then they have to, like, uh, maintain their own thing, or it can just, like, remain on that version that was forked and be done. Good thing is that later, if you do get the budget again, you can uh, you can address those breaking changes and just merge the fork back into the monorepo, so they are back uh, up to date with you. Uh, there will be many pull requests in the monorepo, and it will be kind of maybe hard to figure out what you need reviewing. Uh, for that, you have to set up proper code owners. So uh, code owners on GitHub allows you to define for which paths which people should be added as reviewers. Um, so that, that will help. There's similar things on, on other uh, platforms, like on DevOps there are uh, branch protection policies which allow you to automatically assign reviewers based on what was changed. Uh, last, I would like to touch on some alternative approaches. Uh, so I would say that custom elements, or as they usually called web components, they could con be considered micro frontends because you could build each application as a native web component and just add this sort of script tag uh, in some host application and you just use that widget that was exposed as a custom element from this script. Um, and that way you can comp compose many different like you, you could pack a whole application in this sort of uh, custom element. Uh, and they can communicate with each other as well using events and uh, by passing attributes. Uh, now, two other technologies which I only learned about uh, when I started preparing for this presentation are server-side includes and edge-side includes. I don't really know much about those. They look a bit old school to me, I don't know. Some of them, like edge side includes are like, the standard is from 2001, something like that. So um, I don't know if this is like used, but to me it seems to be more focused on when you have kind of static HTML content that you want to kind of compose, maybe something like this menu CGI, which, which would get uh, generated at, at runtime, but uh, I, I, I'm not really sure about this. I don't know enough about it. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, here are some of the resources. The second link is a great video by that same guy who wrote the book. Uh, it's like 40 minutes, but it's really great to, to understand how this works, both with Module Federation and with NX. Uh, yeah, questions? Yes, Bambi? Uh, you did mention that um, it's one repository, right? So the problem with multiple teams. Yeah. Uh, but could it work, for example, with uh, Git submodules? Okay, so the question was why not use Git submodules? Uh, we tried it. Uh, so initially we were designing between multi repo and mono repo. So yeah, you, you could have those individual applications as sub-modules. 
but uh, like I, I I have troubles with managing sub modules. Like it, I still don't like understand it fully. I mean, maybe it's due to lack of knowledge, but uh, but uh, updating those modules is kind of weird to me. I don't know. Uh, but it, it could work, it could work, but you would, you would need a bit more process about keeping it up to date. Okay, yes? What is the best way to pass the data from the micro contents to the shell application? Okay, so the question was how to pass data the other direction, from micro frontend to the host. Uh, so I can answer for Angular, I don't know about React, but uh, we've seen that we have uh, we can have we have this concept of services in Angular, which are singletons across all all the all the applications. So each application can inject that service using dependency injection. So each application can get an instance of it, and it's a shared instance, a singleton. So through that service, you can uh, have some methods that can be called. Um, or what's commonly done in Angular, you also have observables that can be uh, set from one application and subscribed to in another application. And uh, that that's like getting into some territory about RxJS, which is used in Angular. But basically you would share observables between applications and whichever application could emit new, new values to those ob observables, and whoever is subscribed to them could uh, listen to changes on them. Uh, and this can work in, I, it doesn't matter in which direction you do it. So I'm, in, in my example, I was doing login from the host application, but I was subscribing to the user observable in both the host application and a child application. So you could also do it the other way around. I mean, login is not a good example, but you could have something else that you change in, in a micro front end and you subscribe in the parent. Okay. So you can have like the same uh, stores, they management. Yes. In this case, it doesn't matter that it's on a, uh, in multiple repositories. What, what, matter, what matters is that module federation made those modules shared between all the applications. And you can do that even if it's uh, not part of the same repository. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, then uh, thank you. Uh